morning, everyone. I am Braxton Simpson, a sophomore here at Tennessee State University, and I currently serve as student trustee on the university's board of trustees, as well as a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated's International Mass Committee. Today, I have the esteemed honor and pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, Reverend Dr. William J. Barber II. Our featured keynote speaker is a highly sought after speaker and has given keynote addresses at hundreds of national and state conferences, most notably the 2016 Democratic National Convention. Reverend Dr. William J. Barber II is the president and senior lecturer of Repairs of the Breach, co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for more revival, bishop with the College of Affirming Bishops and Faith Leaders, visiting professor at Union Theological Seminary, pastor of Greenleaf Christian Church, Disciples of Christ in Goldsboro, North Carolina, and a published author. Reverend Dr. Barber is also the architect of the Forward Together More Movement, which has been called the New Civil Rights Movement. The Forward Together More Movement seeks equal treatment and opportunity for all, regardless of economic status, sexual orientation, gender identity, belief, race, geography, and any other basis of discrimination. Dr. Barber gained national attention with his Moral Monday protest at the North Carolina General Assembly in 2013. These weekly protests drew tens of thousands of North Carolinians to the state legislature to protest against unfair treatment, discrimination, and adverse effects of government legislation on the citizens of North Carolina. Reverend Dr. Barber currently sits on the National NAACP Board of Directors. A former Mel King Fellow at MIT, he is currently a visiting professor of public theology and activism at Union Theological Seminary, and is a senior fellow at Auburn Seminary. Regularly featured in media outlets such as MSNBC, CNN, New York Times, Washington Post, and The Nation Magazine. He is the 2015 recipient of the Puffin Award and the Franklin D. Roosevelt Four Freedoms Award. Without further ado, please help me in welcoming Reverend Dr. William Barber II. Good morning. It is good to be with you today. I want to first thank God for God's grace and mercy. Uh, just a week ago, a uh, week and two days ago, I laid my baby brother to rest and had to preach his eulogy. And these have been some teary times for me, but I thank God for many of you who sent prayers. I thank God for that sustaining grace <clears throat> that is always sufficient. To the president of Tennessee State, to whom I could not say no to, uh, she made sure I didn't say no, and um, we love her. Let's give her a hand. And to all of the presidents of the HBCUs, to your honoree today, to all of the students that are here, um, to all of the elected officials congressmen, governors, and others who have come here today. Now, I've not come <clears throat> today um, to celebrate the memory of Dr. King. I, I don't celebrate his memory because you don't celebrate martyrs. You join them. <clears throat> it is um, irreverent to only meet once a year and celebrate somebody who died for you. Uh, so I come to call us to action. And I come recruiting today, recruiting you to be a part of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. Uh, some are here, information. And I come today inspired by a scripture, inspired by a song that John Legend is releasing about you have to do more than just preach or you can't just preach and the social political condition we're in and I want to talk a little bit about Dr. King preached with more than just words 
<clears throat> the scriptures tell us that Jesus came preaching with power and authority, brothers and sisters of the clergy, because his preaching laid out a mission and a ministry in the face of the narcissistic cruelty tyrants of his day. You know, when Jesus began preaching, <clears throat> Uh, there was a narcissistic, egotistical builder on the throne named, I mean, Trump, Caesar, 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 what was his name, Caesar. <clears throat> and his preaching was from start to finish a call to action. Now, I want to tell the media, I didn't come to preach as a Democrat, I'm a registered independent, I've come to preach from a moral perspective. In his very first sermon, in his hometown, Jesus preached, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach good news to the poor. And that word poor there is the Greek word patokos, which literally means those who've been made poor by government systems. <clears throat> he sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoner, recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. In other words, to declare that everybody that society says is unacceptable, God says, I will accept them. <clears throat> and at the end of his life, as he head toward the cross, in Matthew, Jesus was still preaching. And he said, not that we as individuals would be judged by our individual charity. That is a demeaning of the gospel. He said, God will say to the nations, you know, some of us know the book. He didn't say God would say to individuals, did you give somebody a turkey on Thanksgiving or did you, or did you have a tutorial session with a few children? He said, I will say to the nations, when I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was thirsty, did you give me something to drink? When I was an immigrant, did you invite me in? When I was naked, did you clothe me? When I was sick, did you visit me or give me health care? When I was in prison, did you visit me? And then he said, because inasmuch as you do to the least of these nations, government, governors, congresspeople, pastors, you've done it unto me. And if you don't do it unto them, then you shall be judged. Martin Luther King Jr. preached but we make a dangerous mistake to suggest that his words were just soaring oratory. Mon King preached upon the foundation of civil disobedience and he called for a movement to challenge the demons of Jim Crow. His preaching confronted racism, the evil of racism and poverty and war not only within the quarantine of a sanctuary and not only at a ceremony because they wouldn't have killed him for that but he preached and acted in the streets of the nation in 1967 just a year before his death he preached a sermon entitled when silence is betrayal and he said we still have a choice today Nonviolent coexistence or violent co-annihilation. We must move past indecision to action. He then said, now let us begin. Now let us rededicate ourselves to the long and bitter but beautiful struggle for a new world. This is the calling of the sons of God. And our brothers wait eagerly for our response. Shall we say the odds are too great? Shall we tell them the struggle is too hard? 
Will our message be that the forces of American life are against the fullness of all people's freedom? That's how he was talking one year before he was shot on the very next year, on the very next day. And when he dared to challenge, I got to tell the truth, when he dared to challenge racism and poverty and militarism together and call all of those evils and to challenge America, he lost his open invitation to the White House. Civil rights organizations came out against him, black ones. Fellow preachers walked away from him. And when he started the Poor People's Campaign, there were many people who said, who did not stand with him. They came to his funeral because we have a dangerous reality in the, in the existential, ex, uh, existential lives of our of people that somehow we love the tombs of the prophets. We love the tombs of the prophets. <clears throat> but we do not love the prophets when they are alive. alive. He called us to make the right choice. And then the last night when he was in Memphis. That last night. And, 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 and sometimes the media and others, they all like to grab his hoop and not listen to his substance. I have a dream was the hoop. Uh, I've been to the mountaintop and I've looked over and I, that was the hoop. He had done that before. But before he said any of that in Memphis, he said, he said, America is sick. Two weeks earlier, he had said, America must be born again. The sermon he was going to preach that Sunday, if he had lived, was America is going to hell. If she doesn't deal with the issue of poverty and racism and militarism in her policies. That night, he said, now let me say as I move to my conclusion, we have to give ourselves to this struggle. Because nothing would be more tragic than for us to stop at this point in Memphis. We got to see it through. And when we have our march, he said, you need to be there. If you got to leave work, if you got to leave school, be concerned about your brother. You may not be on strike, but we either go up together or we go down together. This, my friends, is the Martin Luther King, the preacher who understood that to preach has always meant more than oratory and words. To preach in the tradition of Martin Luther King is to agitate. And yes, it is to separate from injustice. And it is not just some cute love that says everybody loves everybody. It is the kind of love that dares to tell the truth about injustice. And if you're not going to deal with that part of Dr. King, then leave him alone. Jesus connected preaching to deeds of liberation, incarnate acts of liberation, work toward wholeness. To preach is to proclaim, it is to speak to the death of our times, it is to take words and put flesh on them that challenge the forces that kill. A preach word is not anything until it takes on flesh and gets the work. The living word of God renders a reorientation in our lives. Preach the good news at all times, St. Francis of Assisi said, and when necessary, use words. <laughs> Preaching must beget a living contradiction. To preach is to have a quarrel with the world's injustices. The preach word must put on flesh and suit up for struggle. If it doesn't, it's just preaching. It's just pretending, and it's not preaching. Moses preached and his preaching turned into a movement that challenged the oppression of Pharaoh. Isaiah preached but his word called for deeds when he went to his state house and asked the politicians of his day 
Is this the kind of fasting you think that God has chosen? No, I need you to pay people what they deserve. Or in Isaiah 10, when God told Isaiah to say to the politicians of his day, Woe unto you who legislate evil and rob the poor of their rights and make women and children your prey. Amos preached to raise up a remnant that would let justice roll down like water. Ezekiel preached until a valley of dry bones turned into an army of hope. Because in the days of Ezekiel, the politicians were so ruthless that he said, your politicians have become like wolves, devouring the poor and the women and the children and the sick and the immigrant. Sojourner preached, truth preached, and spoke relentless. William Lord Garrison, a true white evangelical who was an abolitionist, he preached and fought in the abolition movement. Fannie Lou Hamer preached and stood up for freedom and said, I didn't come here for just one seat. Rabbi Heschel, the Jewish rabbi, preached and drew on the Torah. And Rabbi Heschel said, there always is a, 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 a quarrel between Pharaoh and Moses. Pharaoh is not ready to capitulate. The exodus began, but it is far from having been completed. And then Rabbi Heschel, who Cornel West called the strongest condemnation of racism by a white man since William Lloyd Garrison. This is, this is a white man talking. This is William, this is Rabbi Heschel. Racism is Satanism. It is unmitigated evil. Heschel told Kennedy, he told her, you cannot worship God and at the same time look at a man as if he was a horse just because he's a different color than you. He said, religion cannot coexist with racism. It is a grave violation of the fundamental religious principle not to murder. R racism is public humiliation and in the Talmud, he, public humiliation is tantamount to murder. That's Rabbi Heschel. And then Heschel put legs on his preaching. And he marched with Dr. Kring across the Edmunds Pettus Bridge. Dorothy Day preached in the Catholic Worker. And so preaching, if it's only words, and does not lead to acts of liberation on behalf of the poor, the imprisoned, the sick, the oppressed, and all those made to feel unaccepted, then preaching is just words with no purpose, talk with no action, lip service with no love, the sound and fury that signifies nothing. But did not Paul say, if I speak with tongues of men and angels, but have not love? So when we remember Dr. King, it's not enough to talk about celebration or his orator. And it's not enough to say, well, Dr. King just wanted everybody to come together. No, he didn't. He wanted folk to change. Just coming together, sitting in the real same room and then letting the injustice stay like it is, is not the unity. He was a real preacher. He didn't just pontificate once a year or at speeches. His articulation was turned into liberation. And preaching is only authentic if it's embodied. So, on these Martin Luther King, wherever I go, I've been to four of them. People, everybody comes to say they love Dr. King. Corporations come. They'll even buy you a little breakfast now. And politicians come. Somebody like Mike Pence will take a quote from Dr. King, doesn't even know what it means. <laughs> Y'all saw that? He said, one of my favorite quotes is when Dr. King said, make real the promises of democracy, and that's what Mr. Trump is trying to do with his wall. Are you nuts? <laughs> I mean, that ain't an anti-Republican thing. That's just foolish. When Dr. King said, make real the promise of democracy, he was talking about undoing racism and fighting for labor rights and living wages. So politicians can't say they love Dr. King and how he stood for love and unity, but then you deny and refuse to support his agenda. Right, Governor?
I mean, since you came, right, Congressman? So let me show you what I mean, Governor. Dr. King would not have been for a wall. And the hurting, how many of y'all are not against a wall? Everybody here that's not against the wall, politician, everybody, and will tell Donald Trump, you don't need to be building a wall to separate people. We need to be spending money to give people health care. Stand on your feet. Now, anybody that doesn't stand on your feet, you get to see. Wait a minute. How many folk in here believe like Dr. King that everybody ought to have what Teddy Roosevelt, a Republican, asked for a hundred years ago, and that's health care for every citizen. Everybody believes that? Stand up. Now, if you can't stand up for that, then don't say you love Dr. King. You may be seated. I'm just saying, I'm too old to play now. And preachers, don't just think I'm talking to politicians. Just because you can talk about him from the pulpit, but then you are, you, I'm going to say it like I feel it. They can find you for your pastor's anniversary, but they can't find you in the street with these students and these other folk fighting for injustice. If you are a preacher of the gospel and you are asking your people to tithe, but you are not fighting for them to have a living way, you are lying. Don't play with this legacy because it's not even about Dr. King. This legacy is bigger than him. King, like Jesus, asked a hard question. Who are the poor, the blind and the oppressed, the prisoners and the unaccepted among us today? You know, I tell you who they are. They are the 46% of people in Tennessee that are poor and low income. There are three million poor and low income people in this state in Tennessee. 58% of your children are poor and low wealth. That's why, Governor, we're going to come to the Poor People's Campaign here and, and meet with you and, and march on you, maybe do a little civil disobedience, not on you, but on the systems. They're 48% of all the women. Notice I didn't say black women. 48% of women in Tennessee are poor, 1.6 million. 61% of people of color, 1.1 million. 41% of all white people, 2 million of them, are poor in Tennessee. And you cannot solve that by a little bit of charity because that's not how it was started. So when you have politicians that run and say, well, I'm against gay folk and I'm against abortion and I won't pray in the school. I want to know where are you on the side of poor folk? There are 8,000 homeless people in Tennessee. It takes 85 hours of week work per week to avoid a two bedroom apartment in Tennessee. There's not a county in this country where a person working a living wage job can afford a two-bedroom apartment. In this state, there are 1.3 million workers that make less than $15 an hour. You cannot say you love Tennesseans, not black Tennesseans. You cannot say you love Tennesseans and then stand against the passage of a living wage in this state. Fifty-one percent of Tennessee's workforce makes less than a living wage. Over one million people in this state need SNAP or food stamps, mostly white. In this state, 
There are 740,000 people uninsured. It's a shame and a disgrace for Tennessee not to accept the Affordable Care Act and put people on health care. Shame! Especially when a study from Harvard has said for every 500,000 people that are denied health care, 2,800 die. That means every year that you leak, keep 740,000 people from being uninsured. Up to 3,000 people die, not because God called them home, but because of government policy that exists that create policy murder. And don't tell me we can't do it because when you get elected as a senator, United States senator, or a United States congressman, or a United States or a governor, you get free health care. So how is it that you don't want the people to have what you got? Since 2000, you love Dr. King. Since 2001, the Tennessee state government has passed multiple voter ID requirements and instituted a proof of citizenship database under the lie of voter fraud. What you should be passing in Tennessee is early voting and same day registration and more access to the ballot. The courts have said photo ID is a form of systemic and surgical racism. Nobody talked about voter fraud until black people and brown people started voting in mass. There are 140 million poor people in America, 39 million children, 26 million black people. 21 million of our seniors, 66 million white people are poor in America. 62 million Americans work every day and make less than a living wage. And 250,000 people die every year from poverty. What Dr. King wanted was us to get away from left versus right and conservative versus liberal and to find the moral center and to work to change policy and stop blaming the poor for their poverty and recognize that poverty is a man-made creation. It is not a God-ordained situation. Even, and, I, and let me tell you, I'm not so happy about the Affordable Care Act. I want the media to get this right. Because there are 25 of the wealthiest countries in this world and we're the only one that doesn't offer some form of universal health care. Even with the Affordable Care Act, there are 37 million people without health care. And now you have some people that want to roll it back. They want to take away pre-existing condition covering. I mean, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> Down in the spirit level. I mean, and especially if you call yourself a Christian. Whenever I go into debate politicians and I say, what, let's talk about health care. And they say, well, you know, I, I just believe people ought to have um, uh, access. Well, you can have access to a Rolls Royce and can't buy it. I mean, yeah, I'd, have, uh, I'd have access. What that means is that they want the law of insurance company to do what they want to do. And I said, but I always start like this. I said, I walk in the office, you know, being a bishop, preach. I said, are you a Christian? I said, yes, sir, bishop. I'm a Christian. I, I love the Lord. And I said, did you put your hand on the Bible when you got sworn into office? Yes, yes, yes. You have to have the word of God. I said, do you know what's in it? How can you claim to be a Christian legislator, a Christian governor, or a person who is a Christian who happens to be a governor, or happens to be a legislator, or happens to be a state rep? And if anything, the man you claim you follow gave everybody free health care and never charged them a copay. You'll get that in a minute. Everywhere Jesus went, he gave for free health care and never charged a leper a copay. How you going to follow him? 
See, I, I want Republicans and Democrats to say, we don't want Obamacare. You're right, because first of all, the name of it isn't Obamacare, it's the Affordable Care Act. The reason you call it Obamacare was to racialize it. I want Republicans and Democrats to say, no, we don't want Obamacare, that's not enough. We want universal health care for everybody in the United States. Who are the poor? Are they the 26 states that have passed voter suppression laws? Are they the 2 million people in prison, 1.5 million black and brown? Are they the gay, the trans, the bi, the queer, the people that we want to destroy simply because of their sexuality? When the real sex we ought to be talking about is the illicit relationship between the Supreme Court and big business that produces the bastard. That's the real sex. that produces the bastard child of Citizens United. Who are, the, who are the poor and the broken? The women, the misused, the children, the abused? Who are they? The immigrants from the South who really just want to come home. Can I teach for a minute? We keep saying that they want to come back. They want to come to the United States. Well, Texas was Mexico. New Mexico was Mexico. Texas pulled out of Mexico when Mexico decided it no longer would have slavery. So they ain't crossing the border, the border crossed them. And how in the world is it, is a name, a person who are immigrants themselves, then gonna be against immigrants? How, how did that work? Let me talk. Does, sister, does that make any sense to you? Let, let, me, let me see. Where, where's my congress? I'm going to be through in a minute, but let me see. What, 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 what's your name? No, his name. Cooper. That don't sound like no Native American name to me. Don't sound Cherokee. That ain't, right, am I right? That co right? Governor, what's your last name? Lee. No, that ain't no, no, that's not no Navajo name. That's like Baba. Even I'm mixed with it. That's not, that comes out of England. So how is it that a whole bunch of folk that are nothing but immigrants themselves now want to pass some laws that if those laws were in place in the 1920s, their own great grandmamas wouldn't have been able to come here. To preach like Dr. King is to understand that the, the, the Palestinian child is just as important as the Jewish child. To preach like Dr. King, have some water, is to say and to do. It is to say somebody's hurting my people and it's gone on far too long and we won't be silent anymore. It is when the fruit of our lips become actions. It's when our words call Jews and Muslims and Christians and Sikhs and Buddhists and even people who are not of faith to come together and work for liberation. That's what real preaching is. When young folk go in the street and stand up against police brutality, when nuns fight for health care, when churches open their churches for sanctuary, when a call goes out that unifies people, that's why we're building the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival, and calling on natives and Asian and black and white and brown and young and old and Democrat and Republican to all, and, and, and people of different races and even people of different faiths to come together in this moment. This country cannot continue to survive with 43% of the people living in poverty or low wealth. 43%. When you have four million people that get up every morning and they can buy unleaded gas and can't buy unleaded water. That's why I hope the politicians hear this. I'm not fussing at you. I'm saying it's time for us to put down this partisanship and do what's right. You see, Trump is not America's busy, biggest problem. Trump is a symptom of a deep moral malady 
Nail Painter at Princeton says he is the iconography of a far too often repeated American uh, project, uh, in the, uh, a reality in the American project. We take some steps forward and then we go backwards. Huh? Obama wasn't a total solution. Trump isn't a total problem. The problem is that Trump and his enablers have used something that didn't even begin with him. It goes as far back as the day when black, when, when, when the bourbon class, the wealthy class, would, in particular on the South, would separate blacks and whites along Jim Crow any time there was the potential for poor blacks and poor whites to come together and be a p political power. Richard Nixon perfected it and called it the Southern strategy. The design of that strategy was to intentionally divide black, poor black and poor white people, particularly in the South, in places like Tennessee, who ought to be natural allies. And if they were to come together, black and white and brown, they would form a political power base that could control election. The goal has been to control the former 13 former Confederate states, because if you control those states, you control 50 percent, almost 30 percent of the United States House of Representatives, 26 percent of the United States Senate, and you control over 170 electoral votes, which means you only need 99 from the other 37 states. But you cannot control it if you show black folk and white folk and brown folk that if you poor and can't pay your light bill, we all black in the dark. Richard Nixon used it, some Democrats used it, Republicans used it, Reagan used it. People have used it. It's, it's recorded. This is, this is not me just going off. It's footnoted. There's a book about it written by Kevin Phillips. Lee Atwater said in the 1970s and 80s that it was his major way of playing politics. And it's been the way of the South because if you change the South, you change the nation. And every time black and white people have come together in the South, like they did right after slavery for about 10 or 15 years, the South fundamentally changed. And it took the nation forward. When black and white people came together in the Civil Rights Movement, it changed. So Trump is not the problem, it's this strategy that he's taken to the nth degree. It was designed in 1968 and the goal of it was to live for 50 years and this is the 50th year. But then there's a second problem. And that is, many progressives have now become scared to call themselves liberal, even though it, it, it's in the word liberty. And too many so-called progressives choose compromise rather than confirmation, confrontation. They compromise. And every compromise in this country, the three-fifths compromise don't down, were bad for poor folk and black folk. And also progressives now tend to look for Messiah candidates rather than building a movement. And then there's one more problem, and that's this puny language we use, like who's on the left and who's on the right. Some things are not about left versus right or liberal versus conservative. It's about right versus wrong. We need to change the language. Like Coretta Scott King, when they asked her about her husband being shot, they said, Miss King, what do you think about violence? She said, well, that's her form of violence. But she said, let me tell you what also is violent. Wasn't she your sorrow? When she, when she, Coretta said, look, she said, not giving people a public education is violence. Denying health care is violence. Denying living wages is violence. Denying labor rights is violence. Denying people's culture is violent. And then she said an apathetic attitude that refuses to address the other forms of violence is also violence. We need to stop talking about left versus right and talk about public policy violence versus nonviolence. Policies are destroying. That's why racism is not merely rudeness. You know, everybody wanted to censure Representative King, Representative King for what he said. But people do stuff on the floor to Congress every day worse than anything he said. When you refuse to restore the Voting Rights Act, that's racism. <laughs> when you pass policies like denying health care and resegregating public schools and refusing to assist Native Americans on their reservations and help them protect their water, that's racism. Racism is policy. Racism is not about, Dr. King didn't fight for how we talk, he fight, fought for how we live. He didn't just fight against the language, he fought to change laws.
And there comes a time you got to tell the truth and you got to change the public conversation. And so, my brothers and sisters, if you're going to honor Dr. King, then we need to push a moral agenda. And I, I want to ask, I'm asking every place next year, next year, whoever you invite on the stage, have them do a checklist first. They can come to the program, but they ought not get to be on the stage if they're not going to honor Dr. King. I, I bet you aren't invited to their stage. And I don't mean theirs in terms of black folk. I'm talking about, ask them, just say, are you for restoring the Voting Rights Act and, and fully opening up voting? Are you for automatic voter registration at 18 since you send people to war at 18? Are you for early voting in every state? Are you for, are you for just immigration? Are you for tribal recognition for a First Nation Native American? Are you for ending this crazy mass incarceration, especially now that you got people in jail for, for the very thing that people in California now sell and make money off of? Come on, talk to me somebody. Are you for a federal and state living wage? Are you for union rights in your state? Are you for equal pay and equal work? Are you for social safety net programs for the poor? Are you for diversity in education and guaranteeing that every child has access to a high quality, free, diverse public education? Are you for ex e equitable funding for HBCUs? Are you for single-payer health care? Are you for fair and decent housing for all? Are you for repealing the 2017 federal tax law that took $2 trillion from the backs of the poor and working poor and threatens the very health of social programs in this country? Are you for clean and renewable energy? Are you for fully funded public water and sanitation infrastructure? Are you for a ban on fracking? and mountaintop removal and coal ash ponds? Are you for a ban on new pipelines and refineries and coal and, and, and oil? And are you for bringing clean, clean energy to the fore? Are you for the protection of public land? Are you for ending military aggression and warmongering? Are you for stopping the privatization of the military budget? We now put 53 cents of every discretionary dollar into war, the war economy. The average combat soldier makes less than $30,000 a year, while the average CEO of a defense company makes $19 million a year. Are you for a ban on assault weapons? Ask them the question. Not just do you love Dr. King, because people love dead prophets. But the question is, are you willing to follow Dr. King today? And then, all of us, we need to fight for it. We need to vote for it. We need to stand up for it. Yes, these are tough times. The mean and the greedy are cocky on every side. And never before in recent history have we seen so much money being spent in resistance to the cause of equality. Money being spent to go backwards. But faith stands up to Pharaoh and false prophets. Faith takes on the giants. Faith refuses to be the chattel property of injustice. Faith declares that there is no mountain that cannot be climbed when you're trusting God. There's no political power that can't be overturned when you're doing what's right. America's going through tough times, but we must hold on to our faith. If we're going to preach, we not only must preach in the pulpits, but we must get in the public square. And we must declare that one election can't turn us back. One loud mouth can't turn us back. George Wallace couldn't turn us back. Bull Connor didn't turn us back. Our faith might get battered and bruised. Our hope for this nation to live out what is said might get challenged. And we might get discouraged every now and then. But we'll never lose faith. I've been traveling the country from the Bronx to the border, from Appalachia to Aberdeen, from the Carolinas to the California coast. I've met mothers whose children died, Governor, died in their arms because the state refused to expand Medicaid. And they're tired of crying now. And they're joining the movement. And these are black and white women. I've, I've met, met homeless families and encampments. They're joining this movement. I've met people who have raw sewage in their backyards 
in the 21st century. They are, they're tired. They're coming together. I've met with ap white people in Appalachia and in the hills of Tennessee and the hills of West Virginia and, uh, and with black folk from Alabama and, and, and indigenous families and urban African Americans and Latino. And they're coming together. They're coming together and say it's time now to not just preach with words, but to build a movement, a movement that will change this nation. I need to know are there any students here, and I'm through, that, un uh, that are ready to preach show sure enough. Students, I need about 20 of y'all to come on stage. Students that are ready to put some, put some legs on some words. Any the students, any students, come quickly, come quickly. Come on up here. Come on up here. I don't care if you're black, white, gay, or straight. You come on up here. I need some students that understand it's time to stand up. It's time to fight back. It's time to get up. I need some white students up here. I need some Latino. I need somebody that, well, I don't care what your sexuality. Come on up here because you understand. Like those students that stood up right here in Nashville and they went to a, a person running for Senate to their campaign and got arrested. But they stood up. Come on up here, students. Come on up here. Come on, because it's time to get real with it. Get close to me. Hallelujah. Get close to me if you really understand that it's time to stop just talking. What y'all say, if you're going to be about it, be about it. <laughs> if you ain't going to be about it, leave it alone. Am I right? It's time to get real, right? And I'm telling you, my young students, you've got to help build this movement. You've got to stop these folk that want to come and just pontificate. But then they don't want to help change the lives of your, of your nieces, your cousin, your brother, your mamas, and your daddies. It's time for a movement. And just like there was a movement in Nashville before, I'm asking you to build this Poor People's Campaign in Tennessee today. I'm asking you to go meet with your governor and don't accept no for an answer. Love him, love the Congress people, love them, but love them enough to tell the truth. Because it's time for, don't get in front of the student though, Madam President. Girl, no, no, no. Because they might come after you, but they can't come after the students. So Y'all better hear what I'm saying. Is there anybody else here that's going to stand up for what is right? Is there anybody here that'll say, we cannot just have one gathering a year? I want y'all to have a gathering at the state house. I want y'all to march on the state house for all the things we've been talking about. And if I was in my little country church, I'd say, don't worry about the end because weeping may endure for the night. But joy will come in the morning. If I was in my little home church, I'd say, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I would say, if you stand for what's right, the lion will lay down with the lamb. The crooked places will be straightened out and the rough places will be made smooth. It seems like I hear Hear God saying, stand up and be counted. Fight for the poor. Fight for the uninsured. Fight for those that don't have health care. Fight for voting rights. Too many tears have been cried. The folk before you gave too much. The people before you bled too much. And don't let them tell you, you too idealistic. You just young. You don't understand how to compromise. The hell with compromising. Stand for what's right. Stand for what's right. Because modern day racists and must not know who we are. The Tea Party must not know who we are. Donald Trump and his enablers must not know who we are. The governors of these states and the legislators must not know who we are. We are the sons and daughters of Martin. We are the sons and daughters of Rabbi Heschel. We are the sons and daughters of Rosa Parks. We are the sons and daughters of Dorothy Day and Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd. Garrison. We are the sons and daughters of Abraham and Sarah and Moses and Muhammad and Jesus and Mary and we were born for right now and we who believe in freedom cannot rest. Can I preach a minute? Stand! 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 Put some feet on your prayers and stand! Stand! Tell somebody nothing would be more tragic than for us to turn back now it's time to do more than just preach it's time to put some legs and some actions on our preaching they must not 
know who we are. We've already made it through 250 years of slavery. We've already made it through 100 years of Jim Crow. We've already made it through the Holocaust. What we face now is just another Pharaoh. But here we are, and we were born. We were born. We were born for such a time as this. Turn to your neighbors and neighbor. Give me a high five. And then join me in the street. Because it's time. It's time. It's movement time. It's time. It's time. It's time. Stop crying. Get up. Fight back. And justice will be ours. And it is also